G'day everyone, welcome to Lubrication Explained. In the last video, we looked at Pennzoil Ultra Platinum, which was made from GTL base stocks. So that begs the question, what are GTL base stocks and how are they manufactured? We'll also get into what are the performance differences between these, other synthetics like PAOs versus, let's say, a Group 3 mineral oil. All right, let's get into it. So let's talk about gas to liquid base oils. In previous videos, we had talked about the mineral base oils existing in this kind of triangle between aromatics, naphthenes, and paraffins. And we said that group ones, you're starting to remove aromatic content. Now, aromatic molecules are actually good from a lubrication standpoint, but they're generally quite toxic, so we don't want them in the final product. Uh, then you have group twos, which are further refined. And then we have group threes, which are starting to get towards what we would call a pure paraffinic base oil. Now, paraffins themselves are not necessarily good. They have really good VI properties and very good oxidation stability characteristics, but pure paraffins can result in wax at cold temperatures. So what we actually like is ISO or branched paraffins. Now, the other thing that we talked about was the idea in synthetics of taking a molecule like ethylene, which we could consider the kind of four by two Lego brick, that is the prototypical brick on which all of the others were made. And we talked about how you can take ethylene and by polymerizing it, you can create a cornucopia of different molecules. So as you polymerize it, you can get plastics in the form of polyethylene. If you introduce something like uh, oxygen into it, you can get antifreeze by making ethylene oxide. Chlorinated compounds can make ethylene dichloride or vinyl, and then you can also make polystyrenes. So ethylene in its pure raw form can be used to build a whole bunch of different molecules within the chemicals industry. And we talked about extending that idea to desine, desine or octene or dodecene, and we would take these molecules and what we would call, we'd call the process isomerization, which is taking those molecules and making a polyalpha olefin. So this is a branched chain paraffin or an isoparaffin in its purest form. And that's what gives PAOs um, such great lubricating properties. So where does a PAO kind of sit? Well, we said that if we took group one, group two, and group three, PAOs are sort of the pinnacle of, uh, you know, a paraffinic uh, base oil, and they sit right at the, at the top of that triangle. So now we can ask ourselves the questions, are there any alternatives to ethylene that are maybe cheaper and occur in nature? And the obvious answer is, well, yes, methane. Methane is abundant and plentiful. It's pretty close to ethylene, and we get it straight out of the ground. So is there a process that we can use to turn methane into lubricating oils? And that's where we get this concept of gas to liquid. So the gas to liquid process has actually been around for a really long time. There were two gentlemen, uh, there's Fisher and Tropsch, who came up with this process back in the 1920s, which is taking carbon monoxide and reacting it with hydrogen to get higher C number liquids. Now, as you can see from these diagrams, we obviously have carbon in the methane and we have hydrogens in the methane. So what we need to complete this process is we need some oxygen. Now, just to take a little bit of a step back, when natural gas comes out of the ground, it isn't pure methane. So there'll be some probably ethylene, butane, propane. There'll be uh, contaminants like sulfur and nitrogen that come out as well. So we can't just take pure natural gas and expect it to be able to turn into some kind of liquid. There has to be a purification process that goes first. And of course, like all refining processes, this isn't perfect. So we are going to have some impurities, although small numbers, that carry over into the, the finished product. All right, so let's take now our methane. And what we want to do 
is move that into some kind of chemical process where we combine it with oxygen, which is what we needed, but also steam. And this is going to produce syngas, which is a combination of carbon dioxide and hydrogen. Now, once we have that combination, we can put it through another chemical process, which creates wax molecules or paraffins, right? So by combining all of these molecules together, we can get paraffins. And then the next step in this is that we can take these paraffins and the beauty of the GTL process is we can either just take those as wax molecules or alternatively, we can isomerize them, which is the same process that we used to turn desine into a PAO molecule and we can make our own kind of liquid molecule that looks like an isoparaffin. And from that, we can get naphtha, we can get diesel, and we can get lubricants, depending on how long we let the reaction go along. So the advantage of the GTL process is that it is a relatively cheap way to get a synthetic-like molecule. So the other thing about it is that it's quite flexible in the products that it can create. So we already said it can create wax, naphtha, diesel, and lubricant. And as you play around with the processes, you can change the proportions that you get. So, you know, GTL manufacturers, if they're getting a much better, let's say, price for diesel, they can just make more diesel. There are some um, catches to this, though. Right? So it's not just putting all these molecules together and you get a finished product. So... Uh, let's say, for example, in the pr production of syngas or in the production of the paraffin max wax molecule, you need to do this in the presence of a catalyst. And particularly in the production of the paraffin molecule, we generally rely on cobalt catalysts. Now, that might kind of uh, ring a bell for some people because, of course, cobalt is extensively used in lithium-ion batteries at the moment, and it's a big point of contention that the shift towards EVs is going to re require a huge amount of cobalt. Well, in fact, far larger amounts of cobalt are actually used in the fossil fuel industry for processes like this, because cobalt makes a really good catalyst. So we don't kind of get anything for free. However, if you have an abundant supply of natural gas and you want to turn it into another product, this is a great way of doing it. So Sasol in South Africa uses this process primarily to make diesel. Shell in Qatar primarily uses this to create uh, their Pure Plus technology, which is a GTL lubricant base stock. So now that begs the question, how do the performance properties of a GTL compare with, let's say, a PAO or a Group 3? So on the oxidation stability front, which is one of the more important factors, uh, PAOs still come out number one. You've got GTLs coming in second and the group threes in third. Uh, from a traction coefficient standpoint, again, the PAO manufacturing process still gives you a much more regularly shaped molecule. So it comes in number one, GTL probably a close second, and group three comes in third. From a cleanliness standpoint, right, still the same, and that's because it's predominantly related to the oxidation stability. But pore point is where things start to get a little bit interesting. The performance of PAOs and GTLs, as far as I've seen, is pretty comparable, and with group threes being in number, uh, number three, because they still contain some small amount of waxy molecules. Volatility is even more interesting, because here, in the evidence that I've seen at least, GTLs actually outperform PAOs. So it may be that from a volatility standpoint uh, and a, let's say an overall oil consumption standpoint, uh, the GTLs may actually consume less oil because the volatility is lower. And finally, they do win out on a cost perspective compared with the PAO, but of course Group 3s tend to be cheaper to manufacture than GTLs. So hopefully that's given you a bit of a window into where GTLs kind of sit in the base stock slate. Uh, this is... Uh, a technology that really only Shell is kind of championing at the moment. It's a huge upfront investment to build a GTL plant and there's just not that many of them around the world. One of the other things that should be noted as well is that in the base stock market, they sell on 
100 degree center stoke numbers. So rather than selling like a, a 32 weight or a 46 weight, they sell more in the four, five, and six weights because they're measuring at 100 degrees Celsius. As far as I'm aware, the Pure Plus base oil is available on the open market only in the five center stoke grade. Shell keeps the four and the six center stoke grades for itself. One other thing that that does mean is you'll notice that even for measuring at 100 degrees Celsius, those numbers are pretty low. So as you start to get into uh, you know, things like uh, thinner engine oils or hydraulic oils, then you may see quite a lot of GTL in uh, many of those formulations. But if you start to get to things that are a bit heavier, like a gear oil, you need something like a 320 or a 460 weight, we still don't have GTLs that go that high in viscosity, so you're unlikely to see it in those products. All right, I uh, hope this has been a really good and quick primer for those of you who are curious about GTL technology and where you might find it. As usual, if you've got questions or comments, please leave them down below. Otherwise, this has been Lubrication Explained.